Good morning, everyone. Thank you guys for coming in. I got my man Nicholas Thorne here. Um, first off, everyone wants to give a couple shout outs as we start this thing. Um, first, one shout out to everyone that supported this channel throughout the last year since we started doing this. Recently crossed over um, <clears throat> a thousand subscribers. So that was really awesome. As far as with like the watch hours and whatnot, we're like, I think, uh, I think we're like about 200 hours away from, you know, hitting that 4,000, uh, for the monetization thing. Also shout out to a young lady named Sabrina. Um, she donated, she donated to the channel. Um, so that's pretty, obviously pretty awesome and whatnot. Um, hopefully you guys, my sound quality improved. I invested in a new microphone, so pretty pumped about that. Um, but yeah, just want before we get every you know get to the nitty gritty of what people actually want to talk about, just wanted to uh, you know relay a bunch of that stuff. So thank you guys for uh, popping in, all that goofy stuff and whatnot. And Nick, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining me on a Sunday morning for me, afternoon for you. Yeah, sorta. Um, I just want to say congrats on the hitting the thousand subscribers. That's awesome, and I'm excited to talk some cuts um, and, and a few other topics today. Let's get into it. Yeah, I mean the cuts, cuts are always the uh, the number one thing on people's minds, right? Like you got all these guys. Obviously, the the attrition has been pretty gnarly, for lack of a better term, and whatnot. Um, but you know, like we like we said. Football's football's not fun in that aspect, right? You're gonna have a bunch of people who's putting their heart and soul. You had a bunch of these younger guys who signed, and then you know all of a sudden the dream is gone. And I hate to be like you know crass like that, but that's the reality of of this game. And it's not you know it's 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 not fun, but that's that's how this game works. And unfortunately, that's where it's going. Um, we're gonna probably just go down the list pretty pretty normal, but but before we get like too deep into cuts and whatnot, not technically a cut, but a roster transaction. Um, I talked with Reed about this a little bit. What do you what do you think about the uh, <clears throat> for lack of a better term, this like retirement tour uh, that they did on for uh, Bo Scarborough essentially? I thought it was cool. I mean, it's one of those things that you don't think about in spring football because like we've never gotten this far to where <laughs> it would make any sense for a guy to retire as a Birmingham stallion or whatever. Um, but it's really cool to see, um, you know, them actually put on a pest press conference and it just feels like another step towards, you know, the sustained thing that we're now at this point where the USFL kind of sort of is in year three and you know there's players that have built up a history inside the league that they could do something like this um you know obviously it's going to be a every now and then sort of thing it has to make sense where like you know they're not going to put a press conference on in october uh if you know let's say luis perez retires after the season or something like you know, it's there was a very specific setup for this, um, where Bo went to camp and then like I heard he might have gotten hurt or or something, or if it maybe it was just like a, you know, he's done with football. But you know, it, the fact that it happened, I thought was really cool overall. Well, I I think I think you mentioned Luis Perez, right? Like, mm -hmm. like that's kind of to me the guy you would do it for. You know, like the standard mm -hmm. is weird to me, and this is nothing against this is nothing against Bo or anything like that, but like you have a guy who essentially only played like nine games and granted, like we do remember Bo from obviously his time in Alabama, the Alabama ties, all that awesome stuff. And, you know, people, he did have a nice little spurt as far as his like NFL career as well. So there's nothing to take away with that. Um, you know, a draft pick national champion, two time USFL champion and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but I feel that like not to be not to be edgy, but like what like he didn't do anything last year. Granted, with like the, he was injured and injuries happened and everything like that. But like, what's the standard of this? Was it like you said, just the right place, right time during training camp? But like you got a guy like Luis Perez who 
has been grinding in this spring league game and everything like that. And, you know, it is the pro football hall of fame. It's not the NFL hall of fame. So do you tell the story of football without Luis Perez? I personally don't think you do, especially, especially in the spring, in the spring factions. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a story for way down the road. If you, if like this thing succeeds and finds longevity and we're talking about the UFL year 15, year 16, you know, where this thing is, is set, then you could have those discussions. But I think for right now, um, there needs to be a little bit more longevity as for Bo and like what the standard is. I, to me, the standard is just, was this guy a fan favorite? You know, is this guy someone worth, you know, is that anyone would watch a press conference for? And I think Bo was, you know, he was in the community a lot. He, you know, obviously had the Bama ties beforehand. I think a lot of that played into it, even if his actual USFL career was pretty short with half a season, basically. Um, but, but overall, like, you know, that it just doesn't bother me as much, I guess, you know, I'm like, that's, that's a cool thing to see, even if no, maybe it, it doesn't, it doesn't you know, bother, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, you know, but and James brings up a good point here. It's like, okay, are we going to do anything to, um, like, I don't know if the US, if the, like the stallion should have did something for Chris Orr, but maybe like, I mean, you got the logins, the generals could have did something. The USFL main account could have did something. Um, and that's, you know, kind of something like to me, I just don't know what the standard is. You know what I mean? And, I think when we pick and choose, it, it, it gets real goofy. And that's kind of where my headspace lies on it, personally. Yeah, and I know I don't blame you for that. I just I I just think it's, you know, for me, like a Chris or it's it's you know, obviously we know him, but I don't know if that many casual fans know who Chris Orr is, you know, yeah. and that's oh, kind of the okay. standard I'm at Lu- like a Luis Perez, just as that example I threw out there, he would absolutely get it too. Right. Um, and, and whoever guys who like, if you're looking in Instagram comments, people are getting excited over, that's kind of the barometer I'm at, but, but all in all, the, like, yeah, the Brahma, I, I get it on it. <laughs> the Brahma. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's, Let's dive into some of these cuts. Um, obviously, there's been a couple like uh, tr- transactions that have happened. Uh, J- unrelated, Josh Hammond, um, who retired earlier in camp, is an offensive assistant now. Another another spring league guy going into the uh, <clears throat> another spring league guy going into um, into the uh, coaching ranks. Which I mean, good transitions for them. Like it, it makes sense to me. Like that's. You know, those who can't do coach, right, or teach, and those who can't teach, teach gym. If you get that, uh, if you get that one, uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, I mean, yeah, dude, like you know, going through these cuts and everything like that. Uh, uh, what do you What are you thinking on that front? Um, piecemeal. Uh, I I kind of expected it. I expected some surprises. Um new guys on new teams, you know, maybe we valued them because they were a starter for two years, but they go to a new spot and it's a different situation. Um, You know, there's the talent levels higher than it has been in previous years. So I kind of expected a a mix of like guys you expected. And then like a few like, Whoa, that guy's getting cut now. Um, Unexpected ones, but so all in all, like I, I think I, it's kind of what I expected out of it. Um, obviously, case by case, there's ones that I wasn't expecting at all. But all in all, like it, it's kind of what I thought of it, and I think it's going to get even worse with the cut on Wednesday. You know, where you know these guys are all the guys that weren't close. You know, we're talking 59 through 75. So when we get to the guys that were like that close to making it, that's going to be even more like wow that guy's getting cut you know i think it'll be even denser but there's yeah. still a bunch of notable names in this list before before we dive too deep into it as well i wanted to get your opinions on this game in st louis um obviously championship game a lot of people were advocating for it for a while um what's your thought on it i have mixed feelings on it personally 
I'm cool with it overall. I mean, it would have been fun if they did it in Canton. I selfishly could have probably gone to that, whereas St. Louis is a little less realistic, but it makes sense. It's an indoor stadium. It's for the most part in the middle of all the teams. So like if you had it in Canton, if if the Renegades make it, it's going to be tough to get people from Arlington to Canton. So I, I, I kind of get that, um, you know, and then obviously St. Louis has its own fan base that can, um, you know, support that even if they're not in the, you know, in the championship game, I think they'd still end up coming out to a game. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess I just don't have a ton of thoughts about it other than that. Like, sure, that makes sense. I'm, you know, do you have an not over- overreacting. Do you have an over under if St. Louis isn't in it? Because I think they break, I think they'll break 30. Um, if they're if they're not in it, I still think you get a thirty thousand dollar crowd. Yeah, uh, with, I with I think, no bat, with no battle box. I think last year San Antonio got twenty four, if I remember correctly. That's yeah, so. Yeah, I think I think like twenty five as like the the floor. Uh, but obviously, if St. Louis is there, I think you're talking breaking forty. You know, yeah, you're you're, no, you're I, in that in that I, tier. Well, I think I think I think you could break forty um, with week one personally, and then mm. I think like week one for or week week one them coming back, excuse me, and then yeah. I think you'll probably be in that thirty five, you know, depending on how the team is doing and whatnot throughout the season. Um, similar numbers. If they get into it, I think you can break fifty and it really comes down to who are they playing? If they're the number one seed um, and they host the playoff game with like DC as the away team, I think you could probably break 45. Um, If they get to the championship and they play Memphis, I could see that number easily being over 50. Hopefully Memphis buys in. If they play Birmingham, I think you're easily over 50 as well. Um, you know, if you play, if you play Houston, you'll probably be at that 40 number. Um, you'll probably be at that 40 number still with like 34 of them being St. Louis people. And then them like just fans of the league. And then who's the other team I'm missing? I'm, I apologize. Houston. San Antonio. Did you say? Uh, Mich- no, uh, no, Michigan. Oh, okay, yeah. Michigan would probably still be at that forty if they if they because that's not a crazy travel for people. I mean, I don't know. I I think the Michigan will be that range. Like I know that's very vague, but like like but that's what I foresee. But they kind of dropped the ball, I think, with those uh mm-hmm. yeah. with their ticket stuff. So I mean, you drop the ball with the tickets. I don't. You know, that team could be okay this year, another five and five. You know, how motivated will people be to go to a championship game that they know they lose in St. Louis, which isn't the the mecca of traveling? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, those estimates may be a tad optimistic for me. I, I think if they're in the 35 to 40 range, somewhere in there like they were last year, I'd be totally happy with those numbers. Maybe they surprise me and they, they come out even stronger this year, but – that's kind of where I'm where I'm hopeful for with them and, and everything above that will be cheddar, obviously. But let's get into cuts. Let's Yeah, as you see, I have the Ar- we're gonna go through all the teams and whatnot. As you see, I have Arlington pulled up already. Um might be unconventional here, but the first team that like that like the first team, the first name that like kind of pops off my head is uh Doug Costin. You yeah. know, the guy's been around for the last couple of years. He's had a couple NFL stints and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of egregious to say it, but, like, he was pretty high up, like, when he actually played. I think he played in, like, nine games his rookie year, and he was, like, one of the highest-rated rookies by PFF. But, like, I know PFF is obviously not gospel by any means. I think it's, uh, you know, a little bit inflated and not – doesn't take into account certain things. And by what I mean by that is if I'm Miles Garrett, and I I don't know if I've said this on this stream, I don't know if I've said it on other streams, but if I'm Miles Garrett and I'm going against Lane Johnson, I'm going to have not the best game because I'm going up against Lane Johnson. But if I'm John Smith and I'm going up against Brad Smith, 
two guys you've never heard of and I get two sacks or I get a couple – or I play with Aaron Donald and Aaron Donald's getting quadruple teamed and I get two sacks in a game, PFF is going to rate me, rate me higher. So I know it's a little bit more than that, but once again, Doug Costin was a guy that popped off to me uh, immediately. Next guy was Morgan Ellison. You know, I don't think he's a star by any means, but he's definitely like a competent spring league back. Uh, Elijah Hamilton was a guy who, you know, played, did some good stuff with the um, the Battle Hawks last year, earned an NFL contract with the Packers or the Dolphins. Dolphins are Packers. I know he's played with both teams. And then Calvin Jackson, last chance you guy. Jared Scott, a lot of experience. And then Drew Plitt, guy in the system last year. And then uh, Tenton Saltz, who's been in a starter for them last year and the Michigan Panthers. So. Yeah. Um, for me, the I, you, you mentioned Costin and, and – uh, uh, Elijah Hamilton, two guys who were XFL to NFL guys last year. Uh, Costin went to Vegas, and Hamilton, you mentioned it, Green Bay was the team he went to in camp last year. So that's a little surprising. Hamilton was already cut by St. Louis uh, in January, so that one's a little bit less so. But um, other than that, uh, Matt Lanters was a guy I was really intrigued by. Um, as far as, you know, young newcomers to the league, Trevon Coley is kind of like an NFL vet. Like he was in the league for six, seven years. Um, you know, is like an older guy. I think he was pushing 30 off the top of my head. So I'm a little surprised that, uh, he got cut this early, but, um, I think I had him making the team too. Um, but all in all that this is not one of the more surprising teams. There's a few that were a little surprising, but. You know, Costin's probably the most of all of them. I really thought he was going to be there again. Um, but all in all, like, you know, I, I, you know, there's not a ton. Plitt getting cut wasn't surprising. I had him as QB4 the whole way through. Um, I figure you don't bring in two rookies to, you know, compete with Perez and and, and then bring back Plitt at the last second. That that to me sounds like, okay, they're, Plitt was just there, so they had a fourth quarterback more than anything. Yeah, I mean, it, it might have been, you know, I, I call it the uh, the homie the homie connection, where like you get bring in one of your homies that kind of help you out and whatnot, or help him out. Um, you know, mm-hmm. Jake Kumaru, and it's kind of like Randall Cobb, you know, getting signed, and you're just like, ah, right, dude, like, yeah, en- enough of this. But in the end, um, I think put put probably remains in the cycle, in my opinion. Like when the quarterbacks, you know, get injuries and whatnot, puts a guy mm-hmm. that. Uh, you kind of bring in, and you're just like, all right, well, it's it's better it's 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 better to have this guy than not have him, essentially. So that's that's my take on on Plitt. Um, you know, a couple of the comments bring up a good point. You know, Morgan Ellison probably be a good a good filler for the end uh, for DC and whatnot. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of people are kind of high on Puka Williams. I I don't know why. Um, <laughs> they're like, oh, puka, okay. puka, puka, and I'm, I'm like, yeah, man, DeAnthony Thomas, and they're like, who's that? And I go, exactly. If you don't know DeAnthony <laughs> Thomas, you shouldn't be high about Puka Williams. But um, yeah, I mean, that's a guy who you know, we'll get into the DC uh, running back situation in a little bit. But yeah, it, it's a couple of these guys I can see getting moved around as like late late additions and whatnot. Like Elijah Hamilton isn't a star by any means, but if you have Elijah Hamilton as your corner, your fourth cornerback, that's a pretty good room in my opinion. So and Doug Costin as well. I know he's getting up there in age, but <clears throat> but uh, I mean that's that's where my headspace lies. Any disagreements on that before I change it up? Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll say is, you know, when talking about Drew Plitt, you know, we just saw uh, Memphis, and we can talk about it when we get to them, you know, pick up Josh Love. And I'm like, you know, even though Love's probably a better quarterback right now than Plitt was, I would, I probably would have liked it more if they picked up Plitt, honestly. But, but yeah. we can talk more about that whole thing when we get to Memphis's cuts. But, you know, as far as, like, landing spots, him, Jack Cohen, those sorts of guys – I, I hope, you know, obviously Cone just went to the, you know, CFL, but like in general, I hope they find landing spots as young, you know, quarterbacks. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, Cone is weird to me as I moved to the Birmingham team. Um, Cone is weird to me 
because a lot of people forget like how anemic he looked during during the first like five weeks of the season got hurt and then kind of had like he had a three touchdown game but all they did was run like tight end flat you know it was a lot of check downs and whatnot um Alizé Mack really appreciated it but you know it just to me wasn't like wasn't anything too sexy that he did like he didn't really push the ball downfield I know he had a 300 yard game but that was a lot of like you know, relying on the tight ends. And uh, Nick Holly took, like, a drag route for, like, 70 yards. And I think Landon Akers was back as well. So it, it just wasn't – it wasn't anything that, like, popped off the ball, uh, the board for me. Um, we'll talk about Birmingham, uh, kind of the extracurricular roster movement as well. But, but you know, basic – Basic round of cuts here. Calvin Ashley, I believe he was an all USFL guy. I think there were five or six all USFL guys that got cut. Um, I don't remember if Costin was all XFL. I, I don't think he was, but I know no. he did win the championship with Birmingham. Um, but going down their list, you got Calvin Ashley, solid offensive lineman, Terrell Bonds, fringe NFL guy for a little bit. Um, TJ Carter was an NFL guy, played with them a little bit. Bobby Howley, fan favorite. So to me, that tells that tells me that they have a tight end that they feel very comfortable with they use in that spot. Um, you know, uh, probably Marcus Ball a little bit. Uh, Jersey corrects me and says there were six all USFL guys cut. Trayvon Howard, um, that was a guy they brought in that you know I thought would stick around a little bit, especially with the Chris Orr. Um, and I know everyone loves Scooby Wright and everything like that, but. You know, he's injury prone and I mean he's popping up on thirty years old. Seems like he's more interested in being a meme than a uh than a football player these days. Uh Hercules Matafafa, um, I thought this guy was a stud last year. I think he had some of the best flexibility with his long arm that it wasn't like PETA, but when he was on, he was on. And I think he Kind of not came out of nowhere, but was extremely like productive and a good player. But I mean, we talk about talent, talent, talent. Every team's an all star team. Uh, Jalen Morton, not surprised, more surprised that he didn't get picked up by New Orleans because of, or not New Orleans, Memphis, because uh, Flip's connection with New Orleans being there in the hub with him. I kind of thought that would have been a good like last second like last second pickup type guy um because they're only 15 days out stribbling an injury last year um very bend but don't break uh in 2022 i know everyone's like oh he had eight interceptions and whatnot um but on the flip side it's kind of like i mean a lot if you go back and watch the interceptions a lot of them is him coming off his guy to to become like to be in a good position for an interception, but still that's a guy you kind of, you kind of expect to be around and whatnot. Um, he's been in all the leagues and just to uh, answer foosball fans uh, question, uh, March 23rd is when they get down to uh, the number 50, but those are the ones that uh, stuck out to me. Um, what else you got on this front? Yeah, um, this was kind of the team I was referencing when it comes to guys who were starters with other teams that, you know, suddenly are have to earn, you know, work. Channing Street, Calvin Ashley, Hercules Mata'afa, James Wiggins. These guys are starters. Terrell Bonds is another one. These guys are starters last year for the most part. Um, and, and now they're, you know, not even coming close to making the Birmingham roster. Uh, you know, there was a lot of surprises. Birmingham to me was the deepest roster out of anyone. So I knew just when going through my own predict, you know, projections of 50 man, I was like, Oh, there's some cuts. And I'm like, I don't know. This one could go either way. You know, this is a really good player that I'm saying is going to get cut right now. Uh, and we've seen that, like, even if I wasn't right, it was like, okay, well, that guy didn't get cut, but this other guy got cut. Like, you know, I cut Jojo Tillery and it's okay. Well, Jojo Tillery played better than James Wiggins, who I had making it, you know? Uh, and there's examples of that across the board. Um, 
but uh, you know, Traven Howard's another one who I thought was going to be a starter for them, and now didn't even come close to making the roster. So you know, this is just this just goes to show just how good Birmingham is on paper. Their roster stacked, and I don't know how they're going to get to fifty. They're they're more than any other team. I'm like, they're going to have to cut eight really good players to get yeah. to to fifty right now. If these are the guys that couldn't even get to fifty eight, you know. Yeah, and just going through their roster right now, um, they probably cut a receiver. You go, I probably cut mm-hmm. a receiver. I don't know who, um, because right now I'm all jacked up as far as like, well, if you'll cut Channing Stribling, then it's not surprising to cut this player or whatnot. I probably go receiver. I go linebacker off one they got i'm counting it now one two three four five six seven eight nine ten you probably cut two offensive linemen two off or defensive linemen and then maybe a linebacker and a defensive back i mean that's that's the only thing i can think of personally i mean maybe you luck out one of these guys retires and it makes your life a little bit easier which that's and i hate to say it like that but when i see a guy retire I'm kind of like, I, and then they mentioned like Chris Orr having a job. I'm like, okay, this makes it like this, this makes uh, any of these GMs lives a little bit easier. And, you know, a little bit of the manipulation of like the fit of the injured reserve and whatnot, like Johnny Buchanan probably wasn't going to make this team probably a lot of uh, potential and whatnot, but you're kind of like, okay, cool. We get to we get to put this on the back burner for a year. Let's see how you do with rehab and all that stuff. And then it's like, okay, cool. Like come back to us when it's time, type thing. So, I mean, I hate to say it like that, but that does seem like a reality that is very real for a couple of these teams. Where it's like you see it in in the NFL all the time. Like a guy like has like a meniscus tear, can be back, and they're like, nope, injured reserve. We'll deal with you next year. Enjoy your four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and that's kind of how I feel when when I see big names getting cut on lists like this and what the list will be this week too is you know, okay, oh no, Channing Stribling got cut. Well, that means that there's some other cornerback that people aren't as familiar with that's playing better than Stribling. That's what really intrigues me about, yeah. you know, when when you see names that are like big names, maybe it's like, okay, well, they think there's six guys right now. I think they have six corners. Uh, yeah, they have six corners. So there's six guys right now that they view better than Channing Stribling right now. Yeah, that's intriguing. What you know? What maybe there's a guy that we're not focusing on right now that's actually going to be the best corner for them, and then he's going to play well for ten games, and then he's going to be the guy who ends up in the NFL, not Channing Stribling, who's you know even if he played well, probably is not getting another NFL opportunity. I think it's Isom. I think Isom has probably surprised some people. Yeah, I think because, him. Uh, let's see who else? Madre Harper's another guy who I had pretty low down. That's really that's made cuts. Okay. Um, I think it's. I, nice I, I was surprised Burns made it this far. Honestly. Uh yeah, but continuity the NFL like sure. it, the continuity the NFL time. I mean, like when you look at the Birmingham roster, like. The only – it's weird. The only position I really feel that they're, like, air quote, a liability, and when I say liability, I mean, like, that really – like, I feel like I can match up well against them no matter who my, my talent is, is their secondary, but I only say that really for their corners. Really. Right. Like, I feel like when you have Kenny Robinson back there, I think that's a rebrand. That's going to look really – really pay off dividends. Um I, you know, I Neville Clark, not really too high on. I mean, pick your safety with Bubba Bolden or JoJo Tillery or A.J. Thomas. I mean, A.J. Thomas is kind of, to me, the more unknown of this. But, I, you know, I'm pretty high up on Bubba, on, uh, Bubba Bolden. I mean, their defensive line doesn't have air quote stars, but they're all really good. And I, I hate saying it like that because it sounds so rudim- rudimentary. But, like, if you have – and I talked about this when I was making my like all UFL team is I put Adam Rodriguez there as my all UFL defensive end. But I was very clear to be like, if it's not Adam Rodriguez, it's probably going to be Chris Odom. Like Austin Fialu was my defensive, like my, my, my defensive tackle 
uh, my interior defensive lineman, all U- UFL guy. But like plot twist disclaimer, if he's getting double team, look at Kevin Atkins to have a sexy stat line. It's like some of these guys are going to, are going to demand so much respect that it's going to open up like the other, the, uh, the other players on their team to continue to succeed and whatnot. So like Hakeem Butler might only have 26 catches for 300 yards, but don't be surprised if Marcel Aitman, you know, they reverse their stat lines for lack of a better term, just because people, people know if that makes sense. But yeah, ob- obviously retirements for them. Chris Orr, we talked about that. Bo Scarborough running back room, I think is pretty solid, you know, nothing. Yeah. Good but great, not 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 great but good. But you, you know, CJ Marable, I think, really came on last year. People like what Ricky Pearson did, and you got a Larry Roundtree, who's a better version of Zaquandre uh, White. So I think you improve on that on that uh, spectrum a little bit, in my opinion. Um, going to our next team, see who they got popping up. DC Defenders. Um, obviously, we'll get into this. Abram Smith. No bueno. <laughs> Broke my heart. Um, yeah, I'm not. I I'm kind of cautiously optimistic about the other backs in that room. Uh, with uh, Harris, who played well in the limited time he had last year, Darius Hagens was someone who I was really high on. Uh, with coming into this season, he's a guy who pl- played at Virginia State with Reggie Barlow. So when he was the coach there. Um, so we'll see about those two, obviously Puka Williams, he's not going to be like a true running back there. He's going to be, you know, a scat back at best. So I don't really view him as a solution there, but you know, we'll see if they add a guy they haven't so far, which makes me kind of think that they believe in the guys they got. Um, and or unless maybe they're making some big moves to try to get some big name in there, but most likely I think they're going to roll with what they got right now and, and we'll see, but obviously that that's crushing, especially when you lose um, Lucky Jackson and, and Chris Blair. You, you think, oh well, at least we got the run game coming back, but yeah. now Abram Smith's done for the year, so well, you lose it, it'll be Hammond. interesting. Yeah, you lose. Yeah, I, think, I don't think enough people realize like Josh Hammond would would have been a guy if it wasn't for those two guys earned an NFL contract. You lose the receiver coach Al Vance William or. Uh, uh, Al Vance Robinson, who's now coaching at West Georgia because of this pay cut stuff. Um, I mean, to me, man, like I felt that this year was going to be a big year for Abram Smith because he was going to gain more carries because of De'Eric King being gone. And their tight end group has never really been too sexy for me. I mean, they're they're okay. And now – there are so many questions at receiver that I personally have no idea who the guy is there. And I am just very, I, I'm very, I'm very concerned on how Te'amu is going to deal with this because yeah. I, I think it's going to put a lot more pressure on him. And even if it's even if the coaches are coaching him up, I still think internally, and I don't know Jordan, and I don't want to speak rude of him because I have very high opinions of him, but Jordan knows right now that he is at that point in his career where it's either going to happen or not in the NFL. He ha- might have two more years of chasing this dragon, if that makes sense. And when – when I just I just am more curious if there's more internal pressure on Tayamu that he's gonna press more, he's gonna not trust his skill set and stuff like that. And yes, I do think Puka is playing because he has to now. <laughs> yeah, I think to me this reminds me of uh, a similar team, aka the DC Defenders a year ago exactly. Um, if you know, people are quick to forget, but Chris Blair and Lucky Jackson were not seen as anything coming into that season at all. Yes. Um, the 
the room was supposed to be Jazz Ferguson, Katie Cannon, and and maybe I, I guess Josh Ammon was supposed to be the slot. I don't know. Maybe if, uh, maybe, maybe Chad there was. Had, I feel like there Chad, was somewhere else. Well, that's the Chad, thing. Chad Hanson. Uh, so he that's the old, thing. Yeah. The the uh, so those two guys get hurt. Yep. Now they have to replace them. And what do they do? They a bunch of former NFL guys. They go after Chad Hanson. They go after um, uh, uh, Josh Malone was another yep. guy they got. And they didn't work out. And we see with the cuts tying it back into it, you know, they got Preston Williams, they got Hightower, they got um, uh, Isaiah Coulter. You know, these guys were like NFL vets, and all of them are cut now. None of them are there left. The only one left is really Kiki Cutie and then Vincent Smith. So Cutie, I think, is going to be something for them, but yeah. it's open right now. And, you know, obviously, you know, you've got some vets in Kelvin Harmon and, and, and Jazz Ferguson, who I mentioned earlier who are still there. But to me, this, this is a room that reminds me a lot of the room last year and last year, the first two weeks, it was kind of dodgy, but then they figured it out with, with luck, what they had in lucky and, and Blair. And I think something similar is going to happen. I'm not going to say that, you know, Ty Scott or Vincent Smith or Brandon Smith is going to necessarily be, you know, lucky Jackson or Chris Blair, but I think they're going to find their guys as the season goes on. And they're just going to have to rely on the run game a little bit more in the first couple of weeks as they kind of figure out what works and what doesn't. Well, you also saw that um, Fred Kice and he did get a lot of credit. I don't know if he'll ever get as much credit as he deserves, but yeah, lucky is still with the Vikings and Chris Blair is with the, uh, is with the Falcons, which they do love their spring guys, by the way. But yeah. um I personally felt that those first two weeks was a lot of like growing pains between Kais and Te'amu. And I don't know if they had like a coming to Jesus moment or something like that. But when I, it just once week three came, I was more bought Mm -hmm. into the team. And it, it to me was a whole different ball game to see them and whatnot. Um, and just the gradual improvement. And then they kind of, you know, figured out what they wanted to do with Derek King and whatnot. Um, like I said, I thought Abram Smith was going to probably surpass 800, 900 yards uh, rushing. I just felt like he was going to get more carries. Um, I did forget that they did pick up Caden Smith at tight end, who had a very nice little stint um, with the Giants at one point. Very curious to see what his – you know, bounce back is and everything on, on that front. But I mean, what do you think about the offensive line right now? Uh, yeah, that's another question mark. You obviously, you know, looking at it right now, you think that, you know, Demarcus Hayes, who's their left tackle last year, he'll be back. You think that, you know, uh, uh, Michael Minetti uh, is going to be the center again and Liam Fornadel will be your right guard. And then it's just a question of who's the left guard and who's the right tackle. Uh, there's a lot of candidates right now for who's going to do it. I have no idea yeah. right now. I have Greg long and, and Gene DeLance in those spots, but that's basically guesses at this point. You know, there's a lot of guys here, Johnson, they just traded for, they just picked up is Durant, uh, Matt Carrick's a guard who uh, was a draft pick for them last year. So Darius Hutcherson was with the showboats, but didn't report. He reported for DC this year. So don't know what you're getting out of him. I'm not, worried about it like it's not something that i'm like oh this is you know there's other lines i'm more worried about than than dc's they've got some good pieces still but certainly there's you know with um liam ryan retiring and um and i guess also uh kyle murphy retiring yeah there's there's just a few spots open yeah you lost three guys on that offensive line i mean i think dc's been hit the hardest on retirements i mean i don't have those numbers i don't necessarily probably yeah, but you have, you know, you have the, those two. And then even – and he's not a star by any means. He's more of a fan favorite. But when you're signing Bruno Reagan in the third or fourth week, that's not the most terrible, like, signing. You have a guy who started over several games, and then he's like, hey, man, I'm done. So you don't even have that guy who has a continuity with Teamu for two years, you know, one with the Bandits, one with the – uh the Battle Hawks and then the 
of playing time last year. And as a center quarterback, you know, the transfer and everything like that, like that does mean something. So you don't even have that guy to kind of, you know, just keep in the back pocket when injuries start coming and you're like, Hey man, can you just like, you know, we're going six, six men on the line. Can you report as eligible real quick? Like, you don't like, so, so I don't know, like you might have better players out there, but like the fact that you can have a guy who can just come in and plug in real quick that you, you don't have to inactive him when you have three guys with sprained ankles. I think that's a little bit, a big deal as well. Not the biggest deal for them, but yeah, I mean, the Abram Smith thing is going to be terrible. Um, I mean, I think it, I think it negates losses. Like, or uh, I think it leads to losses personally. Who's going to close, you know, who's going to close the game. Who's going to, who are you going to like that week, the, his 200 yard game against the battle Hawks. Like he broke the game open. He finished the game. They went straight to him and he had those two, uh, long runs for touchdowns like who who who's gonna do that and that's my and he broke tackles on it too like it, it, they were like six yard gains that turned to 76 yards yeah so i don't know moving forward on that going down to the houston roughnecks there we go. bring it back up going down to the houston roughnecks um i think the big one which is kind of funny is Luis Aguilar, all USFL guy. Um, Nick Buchanan, guy with NFL ex- or with spring league experience. Ezra Gray, a lot of guys with experience, man. And something that comes out to me was Ryan Nall. They cut three running backs. Ryan Nall was a guy who, you know, was kind of going to be that tweener fullback and whatnot. But to me, that says something about my friend, uh, Clint Sig. As he's a full, he you know he's that H back role that he kind of solidified his roster spot. Um, unless they sign someone as a versatile fullback tight end type guy, they go down to four tight ends. It looks like, and I don't know. There's a, there's a couple surprises here in my opinion. Yeah, I I guess so. I think this one was one of the lesser surprising ones because they picked up a lot of veterans this offseason too. So yes. you figure that there was going to be a lot of um, old guard that was going to get moved out um, no matter what happened. Um, but, I mean, Luis Aguilar, I think that points to uh, a league-wide trend that we've seen where people are, you know, teams are focusing more on kickoff specialists than they are field goal. People. Well, it's it's moved, um, it's moved back what ten yards or something like that. Yeah, so so I think yeah to the USFL uh, kickoff. So I think that's a huge part of um, you know Aguilar, and we'll get into it. You know, with a certain somebody uh, that that also applies to. But uh, but other than that, I, I guess I just don't have a lot of big thoughts. I was there's a couple guys I was like, oh wow, they cut Reggie Howard, but I'm not like upset about it because again, these are kind of older veteran types that are getting beat out by younger guys. So yeah, it is what it is. Theo Redding was a guy that I was kind of like, oh, okay. But I mean they they upgraded the receiving room tremendously. So I mean I mean I don't I if I'm looking at their roster, I know they go a couple they go a couple at the defensive line, a couple defensive backs. I think linebacker, they're pretty set on um, personally because I think they got five or six guys there. Um, and then offensive line. And then maybe you, maybe depending on how they want to run their offense um, and who is the most versatile playing fullback, if that makes sense, you probably cut one more tight end. Cause they're, yeah, they're, they, but they only do have three running backs. So, you know, do you take one of the tight ends and you put them in the running back room as a fullback? Like, you know what I mean? So it depends on how you yeah. configure your roster. Um, Reggie Walker, though, was added to their IR as well. So they, they're yeah. still – so. And I'll, uh, I'll say with uh, Zuber, who got cut a few days after that, that one was really curious to me because he's been playing at wide receiver this camp, not corner. Um, and they brought back a bunch of their receivers, Kiki Cheesum, uh, Anthony Ratliff Williams, Emmanuel Butler, that I'm like, I didn't think that highly of. I mean, the receiving room last year was kind of fine outside of Justin Hall for me. So it, that one was a little bit interesting. Maybe they see something in those guys that just hasn't shown up on tape yet. But, but well, that, that one was interesting. 
my opinion is with these roster sizes being so small is that even if a guy like Zuber is a wide receiver five, you know mm-hmm. he's your he, you know he's your cornerback five. So if he is your fifth guy on both of those, why would you not keep him? And that's kind yeah. of like because you like I don't I don't understand, and I'm not going to say I do or don't. You know, I'm not in that room making the decisions. But if you're talking about like wanting to keep the roster this small, like you need to maximize your your rooms, in my opinion. Um, uh, no, no practice squad spots, please, well, fam. So, with that being said, like. That's kind of why I mentioned like the tight end spot. Like, okay, who could play fullback? Who could play tight end? Because you're also going to be on special teams as well. Um, Jordan Thomas with the Stallions, like I've said, was playing linebacker and defensive end for the Panthers. Like, as soon as Jordan Thomas comes on my roster, like I'm keeping him. I don't care how – if he's better than one of my defensive ends and he's better than one of my linebackers – in my opinion, he earns a roster spot because you know he can play special teams. You know he can play tight end. I just saved three roster spots because I could take this guy and put him on the field wherever I need him. So that's that's where my headspace lies with these versatile like versatile guys who can do a bunch of different stuff. I mean, Alex Magoo was playing wide receiver in 2022. Some of the – Forgot about that. I, I, I did because I thought – I was I thought they were running like a wildcat, and I see number two running down the field, like for a jump ball, and I was like, "This is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life." I mean, Akil Glass was playing tight end as well at one point, so I don't know. Going down to the showboats down in Memphis, um, what do you? What's first? First name pops off the list. Go, you go first. Dylan Moses. I okay. am I am yeah. heartbroken that he is th- it didn't work out for him because that's the guy that like oh wow that's a name you know that's someone you recognize guy who didn't work out at the NFL level he was he's one of those guys that like when you look at the like way too early mock drafts uh he was like a first round pick going into his final year at Bama um and then had an awful year at Bama <laughs> and uh wasn't drafted had like a cup of coffee with the Jaguars. So he was a guy that I was kind of interested in uh, seeing if he was going to be something at this level. Obviously he was an addition by the old staff too. He's been there since like October or September. So that probably had something to do with it, but that, that one uh, I was like, Oh man, I wish he could have, you know, worked out. But you know, other than him, you know, there's, there's some vet guys in here that I thought I had penciled in as starters like Derek Dillon and Tone Brooks and Kirk Kelly. That I was a little surprised about too. Yeah, I mean, Kirk Kelly for me was a guy that I was very surprised about. Um, Kareth White, kind of, I think I saw the writing on the wall when they brought in Titus yeah. Wynn. Um, Colin Hill, a guy with a decent amount of experience. Um, pretty, I mean, you're cutting a guy like Colin Hill. You're, you feel pretty good about your linebacker room, in my opinion, which I do think they have a pretty good room there. Um, you know, Clayton Bradley is a guy that's played a decent amount and whatnot for a little bit. Um, so, I mean, a lot, Will Likely, that's a guy who's just gotten older but continues to perform, man. So it's kind of like how – how, I mean, what did he look like in camp? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. but if you, if you look into their room and whatnot, like, if you look into their room um, – for their defensive backs, probably going to cut one or two more guys there for sure. And they'll cut; they'll probably cut another linebacker, offensive line, defensive line, maybe a receiver. It kind of—I I don't think they cut a receiver, but they'll cut two tight ends. And it, I think it, I, they're cutting at least one, probably two receivers. They're at eight right now, so yeah. that that seems pretty heavy for a fifty-man well, roster. Well, something when I was talking to the OC this week, you had Doug Martin. He was talking about how great West Saxon has been and that they overuse Sage Surratt. So Sage Surratt's a transitioning receiver to tight end. You cut those two receivers, you essentially keep one with Sage Surratt and you're saving the roster spot. 
So, but yeah, he pretty much made it very clear that Wes Saxton was making this team and how impressed he was with that guy. And considering how old Wes is, it's very encouraging to kind of hear, um, to hear that. And just, you know, he's 30 years old, been in the league since 2015, uh, Battle Hawks, Birmingham Iron, G- Generals, and now the Showboats. The guy's going on almost 10 years of pro football, so it's something to be very excited about, in my opinion. So, I mean, I don't know who you cut on the defensive line, to be honest with you. It's probably going to be Connor Christian. It's him and uh, Fatamalu probably fighting for that last spot because I think Dalen Max stays. Yeah. I mean, P.J. Oh. Hall – is a cut I was gonna say, I think Hall is probably the least likely. He's he's not been able to stick anywhere for the last year or so. Yeah, so. because he was with Seattle last year, so mm-hmm. we'll we'll see what happens. Um, but nothing else kind of break breaking your heart or anything like that. I'll say uh, talking about Cole Kelly real quick. Oh um, yeah, we, because we yeah, I. Uh, this is my thing. I, I get if you aren't if, if if he wasn't impressive in camp cutting Cole Kelly, but their quarterback room it just kind of bothers me a little bit because you know and and he, they're not the only one. I think St. Louis has a similar issue for me. But if you have three quarterbacks, I'm cool having like one kind of veteran type as a backup. But if you have two, to me, and like if all of your quarterbacks are veteran types. That's just kind of a wasted opportunity, especially for a guy like John D. Filippo, who is a quarterback whisperer. Having somebody young that could potentially be your heir apparent to Cole, uh, you know, for uh, Cole Kelly, for Case Cookus, um, you know, to me is is valuable. Um, and they, you know, bringing, you know, they had Troy Williams, who's older. He's like 28 off the top of my head, I think. He's, he's in his late 20s for sure. Um, and I get like having him as a mobile type, but then it's like, okay, what is Josh love really adding to your quarterback room? He's fine in a vacuum as a QB three. I don't, I don't hate Josh love and in, in being in a league like this, but it's just like, okay, now you have three veteran types. And you know, if, if you lose, uh, you know, cook is to the NFL, hypothetically, you probably have to go out and get a new quarterback room and, you know, get a new guy. Cause I don't really see, Williams and and love developing into anything. They're already, you know, pretty well into their careers. Well, what I liked about uh Cole Kelly and is that he was so large that we saw the a couple of times McLeod Bethel Thompson was not able to get over the hump as far as like with their QB sneaks last year. And I mentioned that to Doug Martin. I was like, man, you got Darius Victor, who thick eyes, save lives. And then you got Cole Kelly, who's a tight end playing the quarterback position. Yeah. You don't really need to have a guy like like Cole Kelly be the guy. You run a couple of read options with him, like, you know, and, and obviously – but what they were saying was a lot of the athleticism and the skill set, which I, I always have thought that Case Kokis was way more athletic – then people gave him credit for because he did play receiver at one point. A lot of people don't talk about that enough, but like you grab jo- uh, Josh love, it just kind of, so it's weird. So this, I'm going to talk out two sides of my mouth right now. If, if, if Cookus was a starter and got hurt and they signed Josh love to back up Troy Williams, that doesn't bother me. Yes. If you wave your QB three and don't pick up, uh, you know, pick up Appalachian State quarterback, that's weird to me. Like, grab your Nolan Henderson type guy. Yes. You know, grab your Jared Guarantano guy. I would even say grab your Manny Wilkins guy because Manny hasn't really had any experience. And, you know, to me, it's like when I see a guy like Manny Wilkins, there's a lot of what if, what if, what if. You know, Reed Sinet is, is kind of in that mold because to me, Sinet has only – Sinet is better than some of these other quarterbacks that have gotten opportunities, in my opinion. I don't know how much, yeah, but I, I would have rather have seen Reed Sinet play in 2021, granted they were on different teams, than Mike Glennon 
if that makes sense. Because then you, he goes out there, you're like, okay, this guy's not that good, but he got an opportunity. It's kind of like Kenji Bahar, you know? Like, I was never high on Kenji Bahar, but he was getting in the practice squad cycle. Same thing with Kyle Sloter. Practice squad cycle, okay, he goes out on the field. It doesn't work. Let's move on with our lives type thing. And over the last year and change, there was a quarterback purge of, like, guys like Chase Daniel, um, you know, even Mike Glennon. I, I made a, I've made a couple spreadsheets on it, but you had all these guys who were just locking up roster spots. So I'm getting fearful that we are going to get to that in spring ball. And for argument's sake, let's say the league is like, like okay, $300 million investment. We got five years of this. Everything's good for five years. We don't have to worry about financials, attendance, anything, right? Like, are we going to be at the point where it's just going to be like these guys kind of chilling for five plus years, if that makes sense? I know that's very long winded and everything like that, but like, are guys just going to do this so they don't have to go sell insur- insurance? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, that's kind of, and that's cool if that's what you want to do, but is that like, like if Brandon Silvers doesn't play this year or next year or next year, like, is that something we're going to be cool with just having him on the roster because of what he did in 2022? That's, that's where I kind of lead with this. Yeah. Agree. I, I, you know, I'm always going to be rooting for the younger guy because I watch these leagues to watch guys go to the next level. I, you know, that's what brings me enjoyment is seeing these guys play well and then go to practice, you know, go to an NFL team and play well in the preseason and make a roster and those sorts of things. And, having a bunch of quarterbacks in their late twenties, pushing 30, you know, it's fine. A couple of them, you know, who are really good at this level, but when you're, when that's what the league is, that that's just a lot less interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's balance, you know, like I don't mind mm-hmm. Brandon Silver starting. I don't mind AJ starting. I don't mind Perez starting, but I, what I do mind is, is just kind of them there. Like, you know, that's kind of where my like friction comes, if that makes sense. So that's where I, I, I stand with it. Um, moving, moving on to that, we have the Michigan Panthers roster. First thing I want to say is free at last of the Brian Lewerke experiment. <laughs> and do I sound crazy when I talk about Brian Lewerke, just not being anyone I really like care about? Like, no, yeah. is my reasoning. And for those who don't know, Brian Lewerke was with the Jet uh, Giants, who got jumped over by Jake Fromm um, and even Clayton Thorson at one point, and Mike Glennon, while having experience in the system. He was he was an okay quarterback at Michigan State. Um, goes to Seattle, gets cut in favor of Harrison Frost, who was a 2023 like true rookie eligible for the NFL draft comes to Michigan, gets jumped over by EJ Perry, who was with the team for like 26 minutes and (laughs) got protected in the dispersal draft, you know, and then here we are. Finally, finally it's over for the time being. That's a guy that if they sign in midseason, it doesn't bother me so much, you know, give him a couple grand to kind of hang out. But, yeah, there is a – there's there's not much sexiness to Lorecki. A couple that do do pop out to me, uh, Isaac Darkangelo. I think that was your Frank Ginda replacement, and with Ginda back, you know that's a guy that someone gets hurt. I think they bring back Sean Luani was obviously all USFL. Lance Lenore older, but you know still putting up decent games last year. I could see him getting picked up. Garrett Maig was a guy who was with. Um, who was with the uh, the uh, Vikings at one point, I believe. That's a guy that landed Acres vibe. Um, I feel like he could ca- kind of Caleb Vander Esch his, uh, his 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 resurgence to this. Um, <laughs> Cole Murphy, uh, very surprising, but I think you're absolutely right with the kickoff assessment. Like for that, it is sad. Um, I've texted some kickers that I know about that, and they're like, they're and some of these guys are active in the NFL cycle, 
and they're like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm probably not going to play in this league if, if I had the opportunity, like, you know, some of these guys would do it for like their swan song, you know, just like one last hurrah type thing. Um, guys you see on like the wafer wire workout cycle, Denzel Okafor, surprising. Um, not that he was like very good, but he was so involved in the NFL workout cycle that, I mean, that's the reason why he didn't get signed. Corey Robin, that surprised me. Uh, that guy got hurt last year, but was a mid signing in 2022, forced into the rotation, played very well. Warren Sabah, um, that's a guy who's been around for two years. I didn't think, I thought Ramen was better than him, but, you know, they went out of their way to bring him back, this coaching staff, and obviously they improved. Phil Salah, um, that was one of their first signings at Fordham FCS guy. He's a big dude, probably very stiff in the hips. This didn't surprise me. I feel like I have the inside loop on this, but LaCobe Tucker getting cut did not surprise me. Yeah, it, Tucker's a little bit heartbreaking because, he, you know, there's that story of like, oh, this guy came from nowhere. He's this physical freak. He was like, you look, if you remember the like XFL combine, they had all this, the like stats and he was like the top of all the like oh, testing I, metrics I, and stuff. I, I saw Lakobi in real life at the showcase and they were drooling over him. But yeah. that dude is stiff in the hips. That <laughs> dude was footwork was all over the place. I mean, perfect developmental guy in the 16 team league. But yeah. He, he was not the, he was not who his, he was a workout warrior for sure. Like that guy's, fit, but then once you start putting pads on, you get a guy who dips his hips and gives him a good long arm. Ain't nothing going with that. Yeah. I, uh, you know, they had, they have five tackles right now. And, and I, I, at least respect all of them. So, you know, and I, I like a few of them. So that, that doesn't surprise me. They had a, a pretty good group there. So I get it. You know, I, I knew he was going to be a raw, you weren't going to play him here one type player anyway, but you know, we'll see, but he might be a guy who ends up back, you know, especially if we get um, expansion this off season, uh, yes, I could no see him. Expansion. Yes. If, I'm not if, saying it's going to happen, but if it did happen, like hypothetically we add a team or two, that would be a guy I think might get cycled back through. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, all in all, this isn't too surprising. There's a few surprising names, but you know, Luani's probably the most, but I'm not like feeling that much differently about Michigan going forward. Yeah. I mean, I think they cut, they, they cut a running back. They cut a tight end, um, probably a couple of defensive linemen, and then you clean it up with an offensive lineman. I mean, that those tackles, man, I didn't realize how deep they were at tackle, to be honest with you. I mean, I think they cut Dunlap and maybe Burden. Um, that, could be, that could be where I go with that. And then maybe another guard, because I feel that Burden probably transitions better as a guard. But they also had Dunlap, who played a little guard, too. So his versatility might save him. Um, I can say, looking at social media, they're playing Burton at guard and they're playing Dunlap at tackle. Yeah, and they're I mean, both, both and they're both starters right now. Okay, so I mean, but they're both versatile. And then who's at left tackle? Is yeah. it Himmelman or it's it's Pope. Okay, which is what, real interesting. What about is horse horse transition to the NFL as a guard when he had his cups of tea? No, yeah, no, it was um, oh, who was is it? it? Nelson. Oh, I, I have it in my doc. Let me pull it up. Give me a yeah. second. Who because the now was because they had a, a, sh a nice shot where you could see all of the offensive linemen like a week ago. Yeah. Um, and it was and it was Perry back there and and Hills. It was clearly the starters. Yeah. Uh, it was Ryan Nelson was the other guard. He started for them last year, and then they're probably going with Noah Johnson at center. Yep, he was there too. So if you have Jared Horse and Drew Himmelman, which you saw for Philadelphia, how effective Himmelman was, yeah. um, like when like that's when Case really had his good games. If that's mm -hmm. your if that's your situation that you're dealing with, I feel pretty good about that offensive line. I don't know how everything else is gonna shake out. I don't know how a first-time defensive coordinator is going to look. Um, 
especially like like you got to protect Breland Speaks because you saw him tail off before they got Levi Bell there, and then when Levi Bell came back, you know they they or came back was came with the team. Um, you added. I think they combined for another like nine sacks in four games, five games or something like that. It, like it was the speaks had his coming out party, dull, dull, dull. And then Levi came and Levi would, you know, was demanding respect. And then speaks was getting more one-on-ones. So very curious on that, on their defensive line, man. I mean, hopefully Kenny Wilkes can kind of do something with that. I mean, the interior looks pretty good with Daniel Wise, TJ Carter, who was with them in 22, and, uh, you know, Jamal Mewen, Garrett Marino. Like, those are all solid pieces to this. I would have loved to see them get another, like, sexy pass rusher, but that's not the reality we live in, obviously. Um, yeah, and I think they cut, you know, I'm curious to see who they cut at a corner. They'll probably drop down a corner. I mean, I think Levante Taylor hopefully improves on his defense from last year. Very bend but don't break. And then, you know, they'll cut a running back as well. I could see them cutting a tight end. They they rocked with two tight ends at times last year. So we'll see what happens on that front. But yep. overall, I mean, nothing too, nothing too crazy or anything like that. Um, but we'll see what happens. I mean, Jersey's right. I mean, Lacoby Tucker could kind of really progress in this league, but you just got to see, like, what's going on as far as, like, is Lacoby Tucker a guy you're willing to, like, spend that much time on and everything like that. Coming up to San Antonio, what are we thinking on this front, man? <laughs> do we get right into it or do we uh, let's, wait let's, till the end? No, let's 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 fiddle around for a little bit. Um, awesome. You cut an all XFL guy in Drew Beasley, yeah. Um, which, I mean, I kind of feel like there is like him, Ryan Mueller, kind of the same thing, except uh, Beasley's a little younger. Um, I mean, you know, Evan Heim, kind of kind of surprised on that front. Uh, Ryan Lewis was a guy I thought was pretty good. Jalen Samuels, uh, a lot of people were very high on him, um, but obviously it didn't work out. And then you know, Cade Warner was a guy actually I thought was gonna was gonna make the team to be honest with you because they brought him over from Houston. So we'll yeah, see what um, yeah, definitely Samuels and Warner kind of broke my heart as guys who I was excited for coming into the league and obviously didn't work out. Samuels especially because I thought, yeah. oh, this is your um, your uh, Garrett Owens replacement. Like this is a better Garrett Owens where you can put him at fullback, you can put him at tight end, you can kind of move him around. He's useful at running back. So, but obviously they didn't see that in him. the The one thing I'll point out before we get to the you know the conversation. Uh, their defensive line is really interesting. Uh, they they kind of have three guys that I view as starters right now in Savion Patton, uh, Prince Amelie, and Jalen Dalton. But beyond that, including the guys who are cut on this list, all rookies, all 2023 draft picks. So they have well, they three got, right they got, now. They, they got Basham, right? I'm counting him as an edge rusher. So okay. like, okay. so but like right now on the defensive line, I have Terrence Lang. Uh, uh, Taron Vincent and Jacob Sykes, and then they cut, uh, I believe, yeah, Trey Botts and uh, Jason Luan. All of those guys are rookies. So if you're looking for a position group where someone might pop that you're not, no one's really expecting to right now, that defensive line in San Antonio, if suddenly one of those three guys isn't starting and instead it's some guy you've never heard of, that's something to keep an eye on going into the season because they got a lot of young guys that could – be something potentially. Yeah, I mean, KB on Patton's a guy that I keep. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep pretty high. Uh, yeah, uh, pretty high because of the success of the NFL. Um, as far as other positions, um, have you seen what they're doing on the offensive line or anything like that? I know, I know, we kind of that's another see. group that uh, I that the social media has been a friend. Um, right now, uh, from what I'm seeing. It's Derek Kelly at left tackle, which is interesting. 
Um, then Coliavo at uh, left guard, Molet at center, Aaron Montero inside at right guard, and then Greg Eland at right tackle. So they got they um, got Yar they got Yarbrough working with the twos. Yeah, it seems that way. And guys like Rashawn Coward and Jared Williams who are coming from the NFL as backups from what I'm seeing. Obviously that can change just like Michigan could change, but that's what I saw on social media. Just, just stopping videos and spending a, too much time on trying to find who the starters are. Yeah. I mean, I like Yarborough as, as your swing, your swing guard, your swing tackle. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, he's a little bit older, but he's got a lot of experience. Um, probably cutting a wide receiver, you think, as well? Yeah, how many they got? Uh, yeah, they have nine right now. So I think they're cutting at probably two. Um, Might cut Basher. I think Basher, yeah. could, get, Basher could get cut. I, I think Akers is safe. I'm kind of done with the KD Cannon experience, um, but we'll see Same. what happens. Yeah, I mean, like, it wouldn't surprise me if he got, but I think your your starters going in are Acres, Acres, Turner, Justin Smith, and uh, Kirkland. You know, and because they're only carrying two tight ends, and they're going to run a lot of spread and probably eleven personnel or ten personnel, so that'll be their their mold. Um, linebackers, a couple new guys here, man. Like you, you know, you could throw them throw throw that in the edge group and whatnot, but. Anyone that linebacker, you see them cutting either? I'm going to keep an eye on Robert Barnes because he was somebody who uh, made, who was a Heinz Ward edition, uh, and he was a XFL combine guy too. Um, that he, you know, I figured he wasn't even going to make the like protection period when, you know, you had, they had to protect 42 guys, they protected him, and he's made cuts now. So he's still on the 58 man roster. He's a guy who I, you know, especially with the the changing of uh, of coaching staffs, I thought was gonna, you know, not make the cut, but uh, he uh, he did. So that's that's a name I'm keeping an eye on. There's a lot of guys like that where I'm like, I'm shocked he made it this far. We'll we'll see what what they make of it. Yeah, I mean, do we get into it though? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Um, so we disagree on our principle, but we agree at the end result on this young man. Um, My biggest thing with destroying is one, my personal interaction with him where he thought he was God's gift to the earth at the dome last year. And I was just like, okay, dude, like cute. And in my like full timeline of work, I don't get impressed by people um, just because. So when you have this like, false sense of entitlement that like you can cut a line which he was trying to do when we had the same badge color um that's cute in my opinion so but you know he it was the isaac punts thing and then everyone's kind of saying um oh thank you john (laughs) um he knows what's coming (laughs) yeah so I mean, is there a bias there? Yeah, but my bias actually lies more with the fact of I'm not a hater on the fact that, like, I believe that he doesn't deserve an opportunity. And that was actually very – I was very – I was very uh, disappointed by, like, the NCAA's decision to kind of not like allow him to monetize his YouTube channel because like these kids, like being an, you know, and granted, I don't, I think the NIL is too extreme now. Like I don't think I should give someone $10 million to come play at UNLV or Mizzou or whatever. But I do think if you're monetizing the fact that like, Hey, this is my life because what's different than a chemistry student doing that. Um, so I think there is balance there and I do think they should get paid for, uh, they should get paid for their jerseys and everything like that. Like I I feel like 90% of people could agree with that. Right. And maybe a profit sharing, but just like the fact that he from 2017 to 2019 to 2024, there's been so many opportunities in this league with these leagues, whether it be the spring league showcases, whether it be the AAF, whether it be the USFL, 
whether it be the um, whether it be like the XFL 2020, USFL, there was just so much opportunity and now you want to do it. Um, I don't know. And I think the real victim in a lot of this is Chris Dunn personally, because I think Chris Dunn was probably the best one out of all three. All right. Yeah. Um, the first thing I'll say about this with Chris Dunn specifically is that I think that's much more of an issue with the coaching staff changing. Chris Dunn was yeah. not a Lillibridge guy or a Wade Phillips guy. He was a Heinz Ward guy. So I don't think even if destroying doesn't get this chance that Chris, it wasn't like, okay, uh, you know, Donald got it over Chris Dunn. It was that it was a new coaching staff and they weren't going to bring him back either way. So um, th- beyond that though, I, I kind of had to realize, okay, I need to form like a, a true take on all this. And I think, um, you know, you can say the whole, it's a publicity stunt and all that. And at the end of the day, I don't know if I really want to interact with that because the, the honest truth is just we're never going to know. We're never going to know if the, the league went to the Lib Bridge and said, hey, do this guy a favor. This would be good for our socials or if this is coming out of some genuine spot or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the the where the truth may lie with that. My thing, though, is and I, and I sense this more and maybe it's a kicker community thing more than a spring football community thing. But I think the animosity has been really weird to me, especially if it's if people are rooting for spring football to work this is a opportunity that we really haven't gotten where like this is a guy who's uber popular that if he can come in and play well and like you know i'm not saying this is realistic but maybe even make it to the nfl that would be huge for this league obviously we've already seen the socials that there's been boosts to everything just from him you know being in camp and so I'm rooting for the guy and that's the be all end all with it is just like, I think, you know, maybe a Matt Corral would be on that same level, but like, I don't think anyone really is, uh, you know, whose success could mean the league success, you know, um, even if, you know, if Quentin Dormandy plays well and makes it to the NFL, I don't think that moves the needle that much, but no, no, he, the kicker, he, he is, he is, he is the guy like if if it works he is he is yeah. the guy he's like, the face of what yeah. this league stands for and, and i'll also say um just before you know I'll, I'll i'll let you finish this up but uh uh if you for anyone here who's still listening to something like this if you haven't checked out project nfl the docuseries he's doing it's really good i think it's the best content we've gotten surrounding a spring football league uh probably ever i mean i like it more than player 54 um what was it united by football alliance broken we've had a few documentaries i think this is the best of all of them it's the most well-made it's the one that's the most honest i feel like with what it means to being a spring football player he's not like you know it's not like the rock coming out and being like look at this opportunity it's it's a little bit more real and uh so you know that that's also like selfishly why I'm kind of excited that he, he made it as we get more behind the scenes content with that. But, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of all I have to say about that. No project project NFL is way better than, than uh, anything that we've had put out. I mean, there was blips of player 54, but it also seemed like a rock commercial and like, I'm always critical of the rock because I'm like, like, he's like, Oh, financially growing up, it was hard. I'm like, Look at look at the Rock's family tree, dude. Like, I'm not saying they were breaking in millions of dollars, but you you were not struggling as much as people want to make it out to be. And I always get mad at Player 54 because I'm like, you were not Player 54. You were Player 154, dude. And like, Warren Sapp has probably the best takes on the Rock's NFL ability. Where, yeah, I've you, seen those. Yo, oh my God, dude. It's like, do we? He's like, oh, this story is about you rushing the, the the quarterback together. And he's like, yeah, that might have happened like seven times. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe he had seven bucks, but I'm sure his mother had 70,000 and seven bucks in, in a bank account. I'm sure I'm sure they were doing OK. 
Uh, you know what I mean? Like, you know, maybe when there was a, a home issue, they were like, hey, we can't go out to dinner this month because we got to pay for this roof. But I'm sure they were doing okay. I mean, Rocky Johnson, his grandfather's a legend. All his uncles are you – know, his cousin was Rikishi, dude. Rikishi. <laughs> like, old stink eye over there. So, I mean, I I think destroying needs the work. I think he loses credibility in even more credibility to the specialist community. Personally, if he doesn't, I, I kind of would have seen like the scene it more. Um, my only issue is, and, and not my only, I have a couple, but one issue I have is the, is the attention he's getting, if that makes sense. And we've seen a lot of these UFL guys start doing their own YouTube stuff, but you have a Twitter account with 350,000 followers pushing his out only. I'd like to see that go across the board a little bit more. I'd like to see a little bit more uh, equally spread out. And to me, like that would have been a lot more nicer to see with them doing it with smaller guys and smaller players because you're only paying these guys 55K or whatever. Let them try to maximize their income. Let them try to build their brands a little bit. I felt like the USFL kind of did that in 2022 with a couple of their players and you saw a little bit of it in 2023 but moving forward like i'd like to see that across the board rather than the destroying show essentially and i'm very curious to see what happens moving forward with uh not only his channel and his growth but also like the growth of other players and whatnot so it would have been nice to build those brands for not only him which they should they should piggyback off of but all these other guys as well yeah uh that, that's a valid point for sure so i just felt like and that was my big thing with the signing was are you going to just have a lot of destroying, like, not like, you know, postering and whatnot? But we'll see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Moving, moving towards the last roster, um, <clears throat> for the Battle Hawks, um, they cut a lot of dispersal draft guys. They cut a lot of, um, they cut a lot of dispersal draft guys. They cut a lot of. Uh, rookie draft picks. They cut a lot of, you know, new players to this whole mo uh, movement and whatnot. The only guy they really cut from last year was Christian Olmstead, who was a reserve offensive lineman who wasn't the best player out there, obviously. So very curious to see what your thoughts on it. Um, you know, apparently the kicking competition was a lot closer uh, between Mevis and Smith. And I think Smith got the job because of his connection with uh, Sterling Hoffrichter, believe it or not, because they played together and that made that battery a little bit closer and whatnot. Yeah, there's not many um, surprises in this group. This is probably the least surprising of all of them. The only guy that really surprised me was John Daka. He was, he was a pretty good rusher for the Roughnecks last year. Um, but he didn't, you know, obviously make the cut there. They they picked some other guys over him. But other than that, like it's a lot of guys who were kind of smaller name guys or guys who've been around a while, like an Anthony Siafi and uh, Prince Charles Awara, who have been in these leagues before but had struggled to really stick recently. So, you know, I, this is probably um, of all of them the least, you know, that I have to say about like who got cut. There's just not a ton of big surprises here. Yeah. I mean, Siafi to me was the, was kind of like up there as far as with the 15 guys they cut like, Oh, okay. But I do think age played a big factor in it as well. Um, moving forward on them, who, who did they cut, man? I think you, you cut a line. You, you, you probably cut two linebackers. You probably cut a receiver. Your tight end room is set. I mean, and then it's, is it secondary guys for the rest of it? Yeah, I think they still have a decent amount of guys that I uh, don't really see as roster guys. Um, you know, guys like Jeff Thomas and Darian Chafin at wide receiver, I was a little surprised, you know, made it this far. 
Um, and there's like a handful of guys. I don't think this one's one that like, like the, the high end for St. Louis is really good. Like I really like their starters, but I don't know if they had, they had a lot of, um, unknowns as depth, you know? So the, there, there's a lot of guys that I would, would not bat an eye at all if they got cut, you know, more than like a Birmingham where it's like, wow, these are all our guys that I know can play. Uh, did they cut any offensive linemen? Probably. What? Let me just check real quick where they're at on on the. Because all these guys out of oh yeah they they have ten right now. So you think they cut two or three? Probably. They had eight um, last year. For most of the season, they had eight. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know they've got mostly, uh, you know, recognizable guys. You know, Dallas Warmack. We'll see. You know, Coda Martin. Probably one of those two get cut. And then I probably, I think it's uh, Coda. I think Mag- it's, I think yeah, it's and then Coda. Prob- you think Coda is going to get cut? I think it's Coda. I think they keep Magwood because he played and started last year, and he can play guard. Um, Mike mm-hmm. P is just crushing camp right now. Like Mike P, okay. Mike P is still center one. He's gotten so much better from what Beck said. Um, if they kept nine for the first part of the season, it would not surprise me. Um, so you go yeah. Chafin. I think they cut Chafin. I think they cut Thomas. So you're at three there. Um, mm-hmm. I think they cut Drew Lewis, the linebacker, which I think they cut uh, Callahan O'Reilly. So that gets you to yeah. five. I mean, and then you're looking at three. Uh, they so if they cut Lewis and O'Reilly, they only have five true off-ball linebackers right now. Um, so you, they probably are keeping one of those two. I think they might be going like a Chris Garrett or a Carson Wells at at, at they, a Drusher. I, I don't, I don't think they cut Carson Wells. They're pretty high on okay. him. I think. All right. Because, well, because Wells played the interior. A little bit, and then they ran Wells in a mug front a couple times, where he was lining up in in the a gap or like as a three technique, mm-hmm. like stand up. Like so, they like his versatility, and he plays a lot of special teams and whatnot. Wells right. will get pick, Wells will get picked up by uh, one of these teams if he gets cut. I don't know which one. We'd have to comb through the roster again, but he would get picked yeah. up. So I mean, I'm at five. You only need three more. Um, yeah, I think they probably cut either Beecham or Magwood. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think one of, the, I, one of those two. Yeah, I think Eric Eric makes it. Um, okay, but yeah, if if because Warmack played a lot last year as well, so that's yeah. a, that's another thing. Like Warmack played a lot, and he was pretty. He's very versatile. He plays both guards and center. Um, so to me, like you, you want to keep that, but you also have Donovan West there. So hopefully yeah. he's working in that guard as well. Like, I don't, I'm not really sure. I mean, I mean, I think he goes, he's, you, he's one and, of the youngest uh, players in the entire league. I think he's Donovan, only 22. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, you don't cut him. Um, I mean, I think you, you, it'll be a surprise linebacker in my opinion, Mm-hmm. Um, I mean th- that's really it, and then and then you got like a couple defensive backs, depending on how you want to do that. Do you carry four corners or five corners? Um, you know, I mean it, it'll be hard. You definitely got to cut a safety or two. I know that. So I mean they yeah. scrubbed that. I mean you could they cut Levert Hill last time or, or chose not to bring him back. Yeah, I know they just signed him probably for depth. I know he was all XFL last year, but I mean, you know, take that for what it's worth, type thing. All right. So, yeah, I mean, maybe. Do you cut an interior defensive lineman? I mean, Kobe Smith doesn't really wow me. Uh, all right. I mean, like I kind of thought maybe a freedom, a King Muladun, or a TJ. I don't even know how to say his last name. Pesafea. Okay. Um, those were the two that I, I have at the back end of that uh, D-line group. Obviously, I'm, I'm not privy to the information you're privy to, so I'm just guessing out here. But uh, those would be the two that I would look at, you know, especially Freedom where, you know, he's starting to get up there a little bit, you know. 
He's, yeah. he's I think 29, 28, something like that. Yeah, he's so. up there. He's up there. He's a he's a KC guy as well, middle Missouri guy. So, you know, he brings his 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 people travel a little bit. I mean, it could <laughs> happen. I mean, they got rid of Pagaman, and you know, that was a guy they that and they said because of age and whatnot. So, I mean, I think Hageman was more the uh, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, Hageman was more because of the because of like the kickoffs. I think he had a good life for field goals, mm-hmm. but I, I I agree with you on that. Um, those are the cuts. I mean, pretty pretty standard in my opinion. Um, we can go over the recent transactions as well. See what they got going on there. Um, yeah, we hit most of them, I think. Yeah, I mean, but we'll just we'll just do a quick, quick, quick uh, chamber coming back to Houston. Um, pretty, pretty standard on that one. Obviously, we talked about uh, Chris Orr, Carlo Kemp. What do you, you know? What do you think about that? I was a fan of Kemp in twenty twenty two. He was. I felt like he was one of the most underrated edge rushers in the league. You never like really saw him talked about as one of the best, despite really good production. Um, but obviously, Birmingham didn't see that in him. But we'll see if he can make Houston. I, I was high on him. I had him as the top edge rusher coming into the year. So clearly, I was wrong on that front. Yeah, Tim Ward going to DC. I know they had his rights earlier, but I guess he reports now. Yeah, that's big. So, they. Uh, yeah. um, you know they uh, they did they cut have Boogie, they cut Boogie Roberts right yeah they did um, didn't get brought up it, that's just another example to me of like a guy who has had a lot of playing time so it's like okay well it's sad he's a fan favorite you know I'm sad to see him go but it, you know it, it means that you know Dennis Johnson or uh, 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 Tisdale can get in there and you know we'll see what they can do because they're you know not they're unknowns at this point for the most part yeah i mean boogie to me um was a guy who didn't really wow me on the field in 2022 but 2023 i feel like because he was out of football for a minute really 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 took it seriously if that makes sense and then like you saw the massive improvement that he that he had, and that's when it kind of, to me, was like, okay, this dude, this dude is like taking this seriously. Massive improvement. Looked way more fit on the field, um, and obviously was was he an all all league selection? I feel like he was. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, well, I think we can both agree that he looked way better in 23 than he did. 22. Yeah. And, and obviously didn't look too good and whatnot, but I mean, that, let me just run through these transactions real quick, but I mean, it, it's pretty much it. Um, yeah. That's the last one. Yeah. I mean, a couple guys on the suspended list, Sage doc tactic getting hurt. I mean, I don't know what's going on with him. Um, I know, Jacor Pearson be back by like week three is what people are saying and what I was told. So I um so I thought I, and this could be just a misunderstanding because I think it was through the PA, but I thought IR was five week minimum. I could be wrong it, about that. I mean, it makes sense. Like it makes it you, makes sense. Yeah, but you could be on it. I thought it was three. I thought like not three weeks, but like three players you can you can match. Oh. Like, yeah, I don't know. Up. But yeah, I mean. I know a lot of people are losing their mind about Jacor Pearson being hurt, but like that's a guy that to me that like you're going to be okay still based off the weapons that they have. Yeah, and I feel like like that he is not going to really hurt that team if that makes sense. As far as like, oh my god, we don't have Jacor. What are we doing? And it's like you're going to be all right, dude. I mean, plug in Stephen Mitchell is a guy that like I don't think people really get jazzed up jazzed up jazzed up about enough um you know and and go back to birmingham it's like i wrote that i could see gary jennings having an all ufl year because no one really knows who gary jennings is if that makes sense um and i don't think easy jersey is 
the Battle Hawks, Debo Samuel. I think he's just a quick, a quick twitch slot guy. Um, we didn't really see him in the backfield like as much as we see Sam, Samuel, but he's definitely a weapon, man. And I think if you have a guy like Peasy, Peasy there, you're doing pretty all right, in my opinion. So that pretty much sums it up for me, Nick. I mean, is there anything yeah. else that really like kind of blows your mind that you want to touch out or anything like that? No. Uh, if it's that time of show, I'll uh, just say if, if you want to follow me, follow me at Thorn PFN on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to be doing a uh, retrospective on cuts once we get, you know, final rosters this week. I'll probably be putting out two articles and continuing doing the roster doc stuff. I'm probably going to do a lot of heavy updating. I just added uh, age height and weight to every active player right now so if anyone okay. wants that information okay. i i couldn't find age on like i, th- I want to say it was 17 guys it was I, I just couldn't find it online hopefully i get that soon but other than that it's you know if you want that information you know go to the roster doc that's pinned in my uh you know that's my pin tweet on on twitter so yeah and if you guys got it new, yeah if you guys are new here please drop a like subscribe if you're watching from twitter uh, transition over to the YouTube, drop us a, uh, a subscribe. We really appreciate it. Um, Nick, just send me a couple of those names. Cause then you can just go on the college website and whatnot. And you go to the rivals uh, for their recruiting to find those missing pieces for some of these guys, if they played at bigger schools and whatnot. So in a couple of these yeah, guys, I'll, I'll you, do that. Yeah. You got to go to their college if you really want to dive into it, but guys, thank you so much. Uh, high water mark on this. We hit about 50 plus a couple times, pretty good for a Sunday morning slash Sunday afternoon, go over to the IFL and watch the mass pirates. I think they just started playing. So appreciate you guys. <laughs> Um, Nick, thank you so much. John Lewis, appreciate the donation. Thank you guys so much for all the support.